A common technique we're going to use during molecular biology is what we call gel electrophoresis. Gel electrophoresis is a technique that allows us to actually see DNA and draw some conclusions about it as we compare different samples. So today I'd like to go ahead and give you an example of what we can do when we look at a gel electrophoresis gel and how we can interpret those results. So to begin with, we need to understand what we're looking at here. The picture that you can see is a gel electrophoresis apparatus that contains an agrose gel. So the agrose gel is located right here. And on either side of it, we have an electrode. So we have an electrode here at the top and another electrode at the bottom. When we run a gel electrophoresis, what we do, we put a DNA sample inside one of the wells at the top of the gel, and we turn on the electrodes. Now, one of the electrodes, the top one in this case, is going to be negatively charged, and the bottommost one is going to be positively charged. DNA itself has a negative charge, which means it's going to be attracted to the positive charge, and the DNA, over time, is going to move through the agros and travel toward the positively charged electrode. So DNA is going to move. Now, what makes our ability to interpret DNA successful is that not all DNA will move at the same speed. In general, the size of the DNA is going to influence how far and how quickly it moves. So large pieces of DNA, so a large DNA molecule, moves slowly. Contrast that with a small piece of DNA will move much more quickly. So by looking at how far a piece of DNA has moved in a particular time frame and comparing it to others, we can start coming up with a relative size comparison between different pieces of DNA. So let's take a look at how this would work. Let's pretend that you just ran this gel as part of your experiment. When we talk about gels and the results, we commonly want to talk about the different lanes. And tradition dictates that we number the lanes going from left to right. So this would be lane one two, three, four, five, and six. For the moment, I am going to ignore lanes one and lane six and focus on two through five. Lane one and six we'll address in a few minutes. In each of the lanes, two, three, four, and five, I have DNA samples that I've run for a period of time, and then I've turned the electrodes off. So the DNA is no longer moving along the way. What do I see? Well, I see a couple things. First off, three of the lanes, lane two, four, and five, I can see one clear band of DNA. So this is just one piece of DNA of a certain size. Lane three, on the other hand, I have two distinct bands. So I have two different pieces of DNA of a specific size. Okay, I'm sorry, two different pieces of different sizes. And so I get two distinct bands. So first off, I can get an idea of how many different sized pieces of DNA I have. The second thing I can do, though, is I can start doing comparisons between them. Because larger pieces of DNA move more slowly, smaller pieces of DNA move more quickly, I can say with confidence that if I compare the DNA in lane 4 and the DNA in lane 5, that the DNA in lane 4 is larger in size, and the DNA in lane 5 is smaller because the DNA in lane 5 has traveled further in the same length of time compared to the DNA in 4. I can also say, looking at the third lane where I put my sample in, that the first one that I encounter, this first one here, is larger, and the second one is smaller in size. So what this enables me to do, because they travel at different speeds, I can do comparisons. I can look at a piece of DNA, I can say that piece of DNA is smaller, smaller or larger compared to another piece of DNA. So that lets me draw certain conclusions, but we don't want to stop there. Most of the time when we do an experiment, we want to go beyond just a relative comparison. Frequently, I am looking for pieces of DNA that are of specific size. 
So for example, I might be doing an experiment where I'm trying to isolate a gene, and I know that gene is 1,000 base pairs long. And I run my gel, and I'm trying to identify if I successfully copied that gene. Well, if I'm just doing a comparison, piece A is bigger than piece B, I have no idea if any of my pieces are that particular gene. So I need a way to give an absolute size on any given piece of DNA. And to do that, I'm going to use what's called a DNA ladder. These are also some kind, sometimes called a DNA standard. What a DNA ladder is, is a collection of pieces of DNA of known size. So a DNA ladder has to be of known size. And scientists can purchase DNA ladders from biological supply companies that have pieces of known size. For example, I might order a DNA ladder that will contain five pieces of DNA. One of them is 500 base pairs long. So it has 500 nucleotides in it. Another piece in there will be 400 base pairs, 300 base pairs, 200 base pairs, and then the final one would be 50 base pairs, let's say, just to break it up a little. If I were to run a gel with this ladder and put, the, put all of it in a well and then run it, I'm going to get five bands. Band number one, band number two, band number three, band number four, and then band number five. So which band is which? Well, because the largest piece would travel the shortest distance, that one right there would have to be band number, the 500 base pairs. The 400 would be the next one. The 300, the one after that. The 200, and then the 50, because there's a bigger gap between 250 and the others, 150 rather than just 100, will have traveled a bit further, so the space will be larger. Okay. Now, let's go back to our image. In lanes one and lane six, I ran a DNA ladder. This means I have a list of the exact size of each of the pieces you see here. Without identifying every single one of them, I can give you a couple here. You can see a very, very bright one right there. The DNA ladder, that very bright one, they tend to include a couple that are very bright to make it easy to identify them. That one right there is 1,000 base pairs in size. The next really bright one is 500. And each one after that is 100 in size, so or decreasing 100. So 400, 300, 200, 100. So now that I have my ladder, I can go over to my unknown values in lanes 2 through 5 and start doing some comparisons. When I look at lane 2, I've got my strand, and I see that it is the same size as this band right here in the ladder, and I know that that one is 300 base pairs. So that means that piece is also 300 base pairs in size. If I move across, I realize lane 4 was the exact same size, so that one is also 300. The top piece in lane 3 is also 300. So I'm starting to get exact sizes. If I look at this bottommost one in lane 3, I go over and I start to realize this is kind of between my 300 and 400. It looks about half, I'm sorry, 300 and 200. It looks about halfway in between to me, so I think that one is probably about 250 base pairs. It's not all the way to 200, somewhere in between. And lane 5 also looks like about 250 to me. So what gel electrophoresis allows us to do? It allows us, first off, to take DNA samples and make them visible so we can measure them. And we can do comparisons based on size. By comparing how far different strands travel, I can make conclusions about the relative size. Sample A is larger or smaller than sample B. And by using a DNA ladder of known sized fragments, I can start doing direct comparisons to my unknown samples, and I can determine precisely how large that DNA sample is. So I can draw 
very precise conclusions about the size of DNA fragments that I've gotten from my experiments. That's how we use gel electrophoresis, and you're going to run into it a lot in molecular biology because it's a common technique, and it's also not uncommon to see gel electrophoresis results on the AP test, so you want to make sure you can understand how to interpret those gels.